Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Brother Bo. And, um, they told me, when they called me a few months ago to ask me to preach, um, that uh, I was to take my liberty and preach as the Lord laid it in my heart to preach. And uh, I hope to do that today by the grace of God. I'm thankful for a group of men that have given the pulpit liberty. I asked them by the other day, uh, yesterday, whose pulpit is this? And they said this was Brother Morton's pulpit. He was standing on it last night. And uh, so I guess I guess if uh, if it's his, I'll just preach what I feel to preach. Amen. Hallelujah. Because he does. And I do when I'm home. Amen. Or wherever I'm at. And I just want to say thanks for inviting me. Amen. Appreciate the PSR is no stranger to me. Uh, we have been coming to PSR ever since we found out about it. I don't know how long that's been, six, seven years. We missed one year. Um, but it wasn't because we weren't trying to get here. We just broke down. Didn't make it. But uh, our folks from our church has been coming. And I have people here today. Uh, every year we've been coming. And it's over a 1,000 miles. Well, close to a 1,000 miles. So that shows you what we think about what you're doing here. Praise the Lord. I want it to stay that way. I want this meeting to stay meaning what it means today. Amen. Of course, the devil is trying to change that. And he has a, um, he has attacked these brethren, as someone said already. And he has an insidious purpose in that. Well, hallelujah. Turn your Bibles with me to the book of Second Thessalonians. And uh, I'm going to read from the second chapter. And I guess we'll start about, uh, about the seventh verse. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Amen. And let's just talk to God for just a minute, shall we? God, you know. You know, God. You know the need of the hour. You know the need, O oh Lord, of every heart. I'm asking you, Jesus, let your works be continued here even now, right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You may be seated. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Now, I'm not a professional preacher. I'm a pastor and... Uh, so I'm going to just give you, as I give my church, and I think that's what everybody tries to do, um, about four and a half years ago, um, I five, well, it'll be five years ago when I get home, as a matter of fact, almost exactly five years ago, that I went back to uh, the church that I pastor now, and I took it. There had been another man there in between, uh, my dad and me, and uh, I found myself in the middle of a situation, as many people do that take churches, 
of a good church that had gone wrong. It had a good foundation, had a good structure, had a good basic uh, um, doctrine, founded on prayer, consecration, separation from the world, but um, all it takes is it just takes a little while for uh, sin to take control. And um, so I found myself in a situation where I was horrified. I was horrified at what was going on. Uh, I couldn't sleep at night. Uh, I was wrestling with the devil. Every seemed like every day or two, uh, somebody else was was coming to me with a story about something that had went on or uh, some filthy, vile thing that had occurred, and uh, and it and it just built until uh, by the time I I reached this place and what I want to relate to you, um, I discovered that they were, uh, there was sin, they were committing adultery right in the church house. And uh, they were using the prayer room present. Now, this was present. This was happening right then. They was using the prayer room to fornicate. And, uh, and I, uh, I, I was, I, I see strange people coming off the street and I didn't know who they were and, and, uh, they seemed so at home and, um, they just made themselves, uh, they just made themselves at home and, and, uh, there was a parsonage next door. No one was living in it. And, uh, and my Lord, they were using that for a meeting place. People I'd never seen before. But they were they were using the house of God for a place to uh, to perpetuate their evil deeds, and of course there were many people that were coming at that time that were doing the same thing. And of course this uh, this was worse than anything I had ever faced, Any, anything I had ever heard of anybody facing. And um, so I went to seeking God. Crying, screaming, beating my hands on the floor, and beating my head on the on the carpet and the walls, and and uh, I was desperate. And I'd get up and you know I relate to this getting mad stuff in the pulpit because I was so mad I'd get up and scream and holler at people and and I, I'd tell them, don't you know what kind of people you are? Don't you know what you're doing? Don't you understand what kind of a spirit that you have? And uh, and they just looked at me like I'm talking about good people, I'm talking about people that had had a had a good background. Of course, some of them were new, but but um, I, I I gradually began to realize they didn't relate to what I was saying. That sin no longer was sinful unto them. That they no longer held the the sting of conviction. And, oh, somebody committed adultery. Oh, that's, that's bad. But no tears, no weeping, no horror, no repentance. And so I, I was seeking God one day and I was, I was desperate. I was a desperate man in a desperate situation. And, uh, I said, God, <clears throat> I can't handle this. I, I cannot handle this. I got a fifth wheel trailer and I got a pickup sitting out back and I'm leaving. Well, you know, everybody's felt that way. I got up from the altar and I headed for the door. And, uh, and the Lord spoke to me, stopped me. He spoke to me as my hand touched the doorknob. And this is what he said to me. He said, I have no other man. Now, you're just going to have to pardon the personal references here this morning. I cannot help but speak that which I have both seen and heard. Amen. And, I, and because I live way up there away from everybody, and some of you brethren have been there, and you know that's true. 
And uh, the town I pastor in is 1,200 people, and I live 20 minutes out of town. So it's just me and God, friend, a lot of the time. <laughs> I've been preached to here. I've been My head's been bounced off the wall, <laughs> as it always is. And God said, I have no other man. And so I realized I had a job to do. I said, God, if you want me, I'll do it. Went to praying and seeking God and fasting. And one day I was in the church, <clears throat> and uh, I had my face down, facing toward the pulpit, and, and I, uh, I, I was praying, and, and suddenly I had a vision. I saw it out the back of my head, if you will. It was strange, because I was facing the other way, and I saw this vision out in the pew, it's pews out in the back. And uh, all it was was a great curtain of darkness. And it hung all the way across. And there was, there was, uh, there was nothing to be seen. Just, just, just sensed, just felt a power that was there behind that darkness. And it was a emanating force, powerful, pulsing force. My heart leapt up in my throat. I mean, I have seen devils. Uh, you, you might think I'm crazy, but I have encountered devils in the past. I'd, I've seen devils since I was a kid. And, uh, I had never felt anything like this. I had never been afraid of the devil. But what I felt terrified me. Uh, to the point where I'm still terrified. You say, well, it's not right to be afraid of the devil, but it's right to be afraid of what I'm fixing to tell you. And so, uh, while I was looking up there and I was saying, oh, God, what is it? What is it? You know, and you know how you do whenever you come in the presence of the devil or somebody full of the devil, you start trying to figure out what kind of devil they got. And I was trying to feel and find out what kind of spirit this was. And, uh, and I couldn't. So I said, uh, God, what is it? And about that time, a large hand came out of the darkness and laid a, a, a chalice, a studded chalice upon the altar in front of me. And in that chalice was all manner of filth and works of the flesh and sin and junk. And it was so full that it was running over the sides and, and, and running down uh, that cup. And then the arm withdrew itself and left it there. And I looked at it. I said, that's it. That's, that's, that's the spirit. That's the problem that I'm fighting. And, and, uh, and, and the Lord seemed to say to me, no. And so I looked back up. And when I did, the darkness wasn't quite as thick. It wasn't quite as heavy. And I, and, and, uh, out of the darkness came the hand again and set another chalice. And it also was filled with all manner of things. And again I said, this must be the problem. And uh, again it was, the answer was no. And I looked back up and, and this was repeated again and finally the darkness was gone. And I could see him clearly. And he stood very tall. Now I'm not putting this in the literal, but I think it's spiritual. He stood very large and very tall, and he was a powerful figure like none I had ever seen in the spirit world, none I had ever felt. And then that was the end of the vision, and I, I, I didn't get an answer. I prayed. I said, God, what are you trying to show me? What are you trying to tell me? And I sought God, and I prayed, and I don't remember exactly now. It's been almost five years ago. I don't remember exactly how long uh, that it was later, but I was in the church praying and uh, and I wasn't even praying about that. But while I was praying about something else, the problem in the church, God just stopped me. And, you know, that still, small voice. And he just came down and he said, His name is Strong Delusion. And uh, so I said, Okay, God. And I went and got my Bible and got to reading and studying and and I looked up the word delusion, as some of you might have in the last few years, and 
And I found out that the literal rendering of the word delusion simply means to reason a myth. So I stood up to preach to those people and I realized that their problem was not adultery. It was not fornication. It was not lying. It was not stealing. The problem was that they viewed it the wrong way. That sin no longer became so sinful because of the human mind's ability to reason itself into believing anything is okay. And I'm here to tell you today that that spirit is present and alive right now, even at PSR. I believe God was showing me that the spirit that was going to destroy many in this age is going to be the spirit of reasoning themselves into believing that what they want to do is all right to do. And the Bible said, God said, that he would send them strong delusion. Why? Because they had pleasure in their unrighteousness. I was praying about this, and this has grown on me and unfolded to me over the years. And I was seeking God about this because, you see, I have fought this devil. Personal conflict, personal combat, I have fought him. And uh, and I was seeking God, and I said, God, what in the world uh, is going on? I don't want myself, I don't want my own mind to fall into this snare that Satan has laid for the feet of the people of God. And so I, I prayed about it. I sought the Lord about it. And God spoke to me one day and said, All right. You have the truth. Your daddy taught you the truth. The elders among us taught you the truth. You know the truth. And oh, we know about all of that. Know the truth and she'll set you free and all it takes the truth to be saved. But God spoke to me, I'm telling you, and said, I give people the truth. And then somewhere else, I come and offer them a love for the truth. You might have the truth tonight, but I'm telling you what's going on right now is God is offering you a love for it. And if you don't receive that love, you will receive something. We're living, I'm, this is current right now, happening today, this morning, while we're, while we're sitting here. It's happening. God is offering to his church a love for the truth. And those who receive it, he'll give it to them. But those who receive it not because of their desire to love pleasure will receive from God this enormous, powerful spirit. Oh, you've toyed with the devil before. You've played footsies with the devil. You've played games with the devil. Everybody's played games with the devil. Oh, yeah, the devil's come around and tempted you with sin. And some of you sitting here today, you have played games with those spirits. And you've come back to the altar and you've repented and you've said, God, I'm sorry. And God's forgiven you time and time again. But this is different. Now you're fooling with God. God's offering you love for the truth instead of a love for your pleasure. That's the day where Elder Price talked last night and said, you don't see very many backsliders coming back. You, know what, you want to know why? Because of what I'm saying right now. That's right. You're not playing with sin anymore. You're, you're fooling with God.
Amen. I'm in the Bible. I'm in the Bible. Isaiah 66 and 4 said, Yea, they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abominations. I also will choose their delusion. God said, I'll choose them. I want to tell you something, friend. When God chooses your delusion, that's it. But notice, notice, because they chose their own ways and their soul delighted in their abominations. You better hate sin. You better be horrified by sin. You better feel an abhorrence for it. You say, well, I, I abhor it in the other fellow. You better abhor it in yourself. Well, they told me to preach to the saints this morning. That's what I'm doing right now. You see, Satan's whole, his whole purpose and his plan is to change the appearance of evil and make it look good. He wants to dress it up and make it look like something desirable, something that is useful, something that will do you good. We live in the age of safe sin. You've heard that, haven't you? Safe sin. Sin has gone through uh, quite, a, quite an evolution through the years. It used to be that sin brought a certain fear of the hand of God. It was soon going to descend on it heavily and very soon. And it included the thou shalt nots of the Bible. It also included the thou shalt nots of men. But gradually through, gradually the major responsibility for identifying and dealing with, with uh, the maladies of this society was taken over by the state. I'm reading this from a paper I got. Much adult sin became known as social ill. We call it crime. Then the sociologists and psychologists got into the act and sin became a disorder, a disease. A product of one's heredity, a problem with roots and unemployment and poor schools, single parent home. Now, if someone talks about sin, it's supposed to be a joke. Sin! But I'm telling you, alcoholism is a sin. Being a queer is a sin. Not a lifestyle. It's a filthy, ungodly sin. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I want to tell you something. Uh, this morning, Satan's whole purpose in every age, and in this age especially, is to change the appearance of everything. To shift values and principles, righteousness and sin, and mix them all up together, and call them by other names, and to give them other faces. I firmly believe that sin is the root cause of compromise. Sorry. You, you. Let me tell you something. I, I know by hard experience because I stand here with scars. I got a right to say some of the things I'm saying. I stand here with wounds that I receive in the house of my friends. Thank God I got some friends here today. Thank God I got a friend here from Idaho. Brother Pickles, I know. I don't know where are you, brother. I might need to. Thank God I got some family here that still believes righteousness. But I tell you, an awful lot of my friends don't anymore, and an awful lot of my family don't anymore. You've all been there. He said, I'll choose their delusions. Why? Because their soul delight in their abominations. He said, I'll send them strong delusion. Why? Because they had pleasure in unrighteousness. God is marking your love for the truth right now. Right now. He's got his pen and paper out. He said, how much do they love it? Can I tell you something this morning? The only way God knows how much you love truth, the only way he can gauge it, the only way he can measure it, is by weighing it against something else that you love.
say, well, I love my family. I, I love my brothers and my sisters. I love my friends. Friend, God's going to gauge how much you love truth. Probably everybody in his church by weighing them against friends and family that don't love truth. And you're going to have to make a choice between them. And that's the only way that you'll get truth. That's the only way you'll receive this love for the truth is for you to make a choice between your friends, your family, and those that you already love and give that up in order to receive room in your heart for truth and a love for the truth. I already got truth, but I needed to make room in my heart for a love for the truth. Well, I, I didn't write the Bible, but the Bible said, said uh, mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and mother-in-laws and father-in-law, all this stuff, they're going to turn against you. Your own kinfolks are going to deliver you up. Hello. So you got to declare sin even when it's in those you love. And they're not going to understand. And they're going to hate you for it. You ever been hated by somebody you love? Bad. It's bad. Now maybe it's not bad to you, but boy, it sure is to me. I don't like being hated by those that I love. And let me tell you something else. You don't quit loving folks just because you separate yourself from them. Every time you hear something new, some evil thing to your heart, your heart hurts all over again. But a far more powerful thing lies behind all of this, and that is a spirit that has come into this age that seeks. To bring a delusion to your mind and make you think wrong. You see, you can pray until you're blue in the face. I've done it. Now pray for your lost relatives. I, I encourage you to pray for them. Pray for your lost friends. Pray for those that are compromising. And you can pray until Jesus comes. And you can fast until you waste away. But that's not going to take the place of you doing something yourself. Can I tell you something today? You, as the people of God, have got to take a stand before God will take a stand. Oh, that's right. You say, well, let's take care of this problem. Let's pray and fast until God does it. No, God's not going to do anything. You pray and fast. You seek God. But until you're willing yourself to take a stand, God's just going to stand there. Well, there's a chapter in the book of Ezekiel, the ninth chapter, talks about sighing and crying for the abominations. I don't hear near enough sighing and crying. Because to many people, these things that are happening are not abominations. They're just little petty things. We have adultery in our churches, or we have sin or homosexuality and and, uh, and and there's not enough sigh and, and crying. Praise God. Well, it's getting a little tough. He said, um, he said, I, I'm going to send all these fellows out here into Jerusalem. He had four of them there and they each had a slaughter weapon in their hand. But he said, first, I'm going to send one angel clothed in linen. and He's going to go out and take a put a mark on the forehead of of uh, of each person that sighs and cries for the abominations of this city. And then he said to the others, he said, go out and slay utterly men, women, children. Kill them all, he said, except those who have a mark on their forehead. Those that sigh and cry for the abominations. 
Well, hallelujah. We don't hear much talking about sighing and crying anymore. Everybody wants to get you to shout and run. Everything is froth and up here on top. But what about down in the prayer room where you remember somebody's sin and you sigh and you cry? And you realize that somehow or other, unless we get a hold of God, our opinions about sin are going to change. And I'm telling you tonight, or today, that if you don't learn to sigh and cry for the abominations of the wicked of this generation in or out of the church, the angels of the Lord with their slaughter weapons will cut you down with the rest. Wow. Well, I don't preach this way at PSR. I'm going to preach this way wherever I go. And, uh, I was praying one night. And again, pardon the personal reference. I just can't help it. I was praying one day and, oh man, some things have been going on there in that area where I live and some churches and some reprobates and a bunch of guys that uh, don't believe truth and, and uh, they hate our guts. And they tell stories on us and tell lies on us and, and, uh, and you, hey, you guys don't even know what it is. You don't understand. Don't tell me you understand. You don't understand. You don't know what it's like to be surrounded by the enemy that hates your guts. You don't know. I come to PSR, I come to meetings and you guys all look at me like I'm a strange cookie. And, and Brother Pickensheimer, he tells me the same thing. Well, what's the matter with him? Cause man, we're in the cave, you know. Listen, let me tell you something. Where I come from, that's all there is, is caves. We haven't graduated yet to fortresses and to strongholds and to peaceful cities. We're still walled up in caves fighting for our lives. They're trying to kill us every time they get a chance. The latest story told on me is I got up in front of my, this was told at a district meeting. That I got up in front of my church and told all my men they had to shave their heads and I was the only one in the church could have hair. And guess what? Everybody believed it. Uh, uh, Brother Pickensheimer, they told it, they told on him that, uh, they, someone came and asked me, hey, is it true that he, that he told people they had to, women they had to wear paper towels on their head? Oh, man. told his people they couldn't read the Bible. You know, this stuff goes around. They love, it, they love it. They believe it. Hey, we're still in the cave. I can't help it. I come to PSR. I try to get out of the cave. <laughs> help me, God. <laughs> and so, uh, so I was praying and, man, I was crying. I heard, I heard about this incident and it was bad. I mean, it was bad. So, man, I, as soon as I heard about it, I went down the basement. I fell on my face for God. I said, God, oh, God. And God said to me, duck. I was telling you what God said. He said, duck. I said, okay, what? He said, but he said, you just get on your face, boy. You cry. You sigh for the abominations of the wicked. And don't you lift your head. Because I'm fixing a swing. And if you're standing up, you're going to get cut just like everybody else. If you're standing up proud and tall and acting like you're somebody, you're going to get cut just like everybody else. You get humble, fella. Oh, I've been so mad and so angry. And I, I've been so, whoo, man, I was really on to everybody. God said, you, 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 you get off of that high horse. Well, I didn't understand what God meant. I just got real low and I got real down and I got real. And so I, about that time, I, I broke and I started crying and I couldn't quit. Once I started, I couldn't quit. Man, I was calling everybody I could find. Help me. 
but they couldn't help me. And uh, and so I, I, I was crying because, you see, I appreciate, I can't tell you how much I appreciate, and I want to say this right now, how much I appreciate Elder Price. You guys don't, hey, you fellas in California don't know what you've got. You ought to send him flowers. You, you, now, don't wait till he passes on. Send them to him now. Amen. But uh, I was crying, bawling, and squalling. I, I, I broke down. I had to bring somebody and take care of my church. And I got in my little plane and I flew out. And there's an airstrip way out in the middle of the wilderness. And I landed and I stayed there for several weeks. I just, man, just couldn't handle it in God. And I cried and I shook and I trembled and and I and uh, one day I was praying I was crying 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 and God said to me finally I just just stopped me and said what are you crying about and I said God I'm crying about the UPC <laughs> it's so corrupt it's so it's so terrible and you know well it isn't here maybe but but it is where I'm at. It's the tool of God here, but where I'm at, it's the tool of the devil. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm used to saying what I need to say. I've, you know, you fell, you, you fellas cringing away. Oh, don't touch the sacred cow here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cavemen don't use good grammar. <laughs> And I said, God, I'm crying about the UPC. You know, this, oh, bawling and squalling. And God said, what's that? I said, you know, God, the UPC. He said, no, I don't know what. Oh, come on, God, you know that thing out there. That, that. And God said, it doesn't exist. You're crying about something that doesn't exist. He said it doesn't have a heart. It can't love you. It doesn't have a mind. You can't reason with it. And it doesn't have a soul. You can't save it. And when I look down from heaven, I see men with minds and hearts and souls. And you've dressed this thing up and you've made it something that it's not. And you're crying over something that don't exist. He said, my church and my church government is made up of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. I didn't read that anywhere. I heard from God way out in the middle of the wilderness. And I, I, I talked to Elder Price last night after what he had to say. I appreciated what he had to say. But let me, let me just say this. It's not a card. It's an anointing. And when it becomes a card and not the anointing, evil men can use offices to suppress the work of God and men of God. Are you preaching against organization? No. What I'm saying is, is I'm saying the devil wants to put the face on something and change it into something that it's not. And thereby send delusion. He wants to disguise himself. You better see through it and you better understand that it's the anointing that counts. And if a man's not anointed and called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and if you don't sense and feel that anointing in his life, you better not vote him into an office. He can't handle it. He'll become the tool of the devil. You know that as pastors, brethren, you know that. You don't put people in offices that aren't anointed to that office. You're asking for trouble if you do. You say, well, he, he's got a lot of qualifications, but does he have the anointing? Oh, 
I feel to tell you, brethren, you're headed into a time when this old elder isn't going to be around. And whoever you choose, you better make sure they got the anointing on their head. You better watch for the mantle when it comes down. You better not just put somebody in office just because they have qualifications. You better check for an anointing. Because it's the anointing that makes the difference. And here's an old elder that's an apostle. If ever there was an apostle that lived in this day and age, it's Elder Pride. And I don't even know if he's here. And I'm not saying this to, to butter him up. But it's because of men and their anointing that makes something work. Well, hallelujah anyhow. I said hallelujah anyhow. You say, are, are you in the UPC? Yes, yeah, so far. But where I'm from, you never know. If you miss your dues one time, that's it. <laughs> if you see my name on the drop list, brethren, I, I'm clean. Hey, I belong to this thing. I have a right to say something about it. See, well, don't touch it, man. Hey, don't talk about that. You bring division. Should I offer my honor and my integrity and my anointing on the altar of unity? I'll tell you what, I gave that idea up a long time ago. I don't intend to have unity with some things. Nothing but a spirit of delusion. Nothing but a spirit of delusion. That's right, I said it. If you're married to the UPC and you think you've got it all dressed up and got a hat on it and you look in and all clothes and a suit and everything and, and you bow down to this thing and, and you think this is it. You know it isn't it. That thing you're looking at don't even exist. Your pastor exists. Your elders exist. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Well, Amen. Run out of time. Mm -hmm. I read a book called what, Whatever Became a Sin. I read this book in chapter 7. It says sin is a collective responsibility. And he states in this book, <clears throat> if a group of people can be made to share the responsibility for what would be a sin if an individual did it, <clears throat> the load of guilt rapidly lifts from the shoulders of all concerned. Others may accuse but the guilt shared by the many evaporates for the individual. Groupthink is a kind of self-deception that groups of people working together fall into under the shadow of group pride. The desperate drive for consensus at any cost suppresses honest discussion among the mighty in the corridors of power. And general agreement becomes so important that it tends to out override the realistic appraisal of alternatives. That's what happened to Saddam Hussein. Everybody's scared to tell him the truth. Because if they did, he just took them out and shot them. <laughs> and he killed some of his most able generals. And I, I'm not talking about slinging mud. I'm not a mud slinger. I got a paper from a fellow here a while back. He's just slinging all kinds of mud. And he said, I'm doing this, brethren, to save the UPC. Baloney. Hiding behind the guys that are trying to save the UPC. Well, you might not like that, but I'll tell you what. You... Collective guilt dissipates. Trying to save, cover his tail bearing with, with save the UPC. Hmm? Well, the crowd's down a little bit at PSR this year. I told somebody, I said, well, it's been tougher this year. You know why? Because there's an attitude here. I sensed it the first night when Brother Keys was trying to preach. The very first night I walked away, I said, well... <clears throat> Everybody thinks we don't need this meeting no more. We've saved the UPC. Don't relax yet. We got, got us a resolution. Well, I'm glad for that resolution. I hope it does some good. <clears throat> but has there been a revival? Did people pray through? Did people repent? Not that I can see. We... We got some that, that might go out because they're honest. But, you know, 
What's another lie to a lying hypocrite? That's true. What's another lie to a lying hypocrite? Got TVs in their living rooms? Got VCRs and, and, and stacks of movies? And had them for years in the manual states that you can't do it. They do it every day. They're living a lie every day. What's another lie to a lying hypocrite? Sorry, I just don't have the same confidence. I wish I did. You didn't save the UPC. The only way you're going to save the UPC is save people and get men to repent and preach repentance and sigh and cry for the abominations of the wicked. That's it. That's the only way. We don't get it by signing resolutions or signing papers. We're going to get it by falling on our face before God and seeing sin for what it is and filth for what it is and carnality for what it is and a love for pleasure. There hasn't been any revival. And I'll say something. You ain't going to like it, but I'm going to say it anyhow. All this preaching about end time revival. And I believe in revival. I'm happy. And I believe I can reach my city. And I believe I can reach the cities around it. And I, bo I believe that with all of my heart. But I don't believe this charismatic doctrine. That there's going to be a massive worldwide. Everybody in the world is going to get saved at the end day. You can't prove that with the Bible. If you can, please corner me and we'll have a sidewalk session, as somebody said last night. I want to know about it. Joel, the second chapter, started in the book of Acts. And it has continued. And it is continuing today. And I believe there will be a restoration of some things. Yes, I do. But I'm telling you something. The charismatics sold us a bill of goods that there's going to be a great, big, huge, worldwide end-time revival in the last day. And my Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible said that it's going to be an endurance race. And that last fellow in the fire was in the fire. Some, some of you fellas, you, you, you think that, uh, you think you gotta be a, you gotta fulfill that prophecy. And so, well, bless God, what do we gotta do to have revival? Because after all, we're supposed to be having this worldwide revival and millions and millions and millions are turning to God in Russia. Listen, if as many people were turning to God, that's what they're saying. Everybody in the world will be saved by now. I heard somebody say 30,000 a day turning to God. 100,000 a day. That's a bunch of baloney. Well, we can preach about death, not even nature itself teach you. Well, let's let nature teach us. Who ever heard of a cow having 50 kids in one year? You're not going to have any more folks come into your church than what you can disciple. And anything bigger than that is going to be a mess. If you can't disciple them and clean them up and teach them right things, you're having nothing but a mess. You're not having a revival. Oh, yes. And so, well, what do we got to do to fulfill our own little prophecy here? That we're going to have huge millions and millions turn to God. What do we got to do? Well, we got to get, I guess we're going to have to go on TV. Well, I guess we're going to have to have all these phony prophets come around, draw the crowds. Well, man, he's got a good deal going. He's got a special thing going. Wow, look at him. He can call folks names. Well, didn't you know your name? Right. Yeah, well, well, man, he tells people where they ache. Yeah, but does he tell people where they sin? Hey! God's got a simple solution for your aches and pains. You just call for the elders of the church and they come pray for you and he'll heal you. But he don't want some man getting all the credit and the glory. God wants that contained in the local church. You bring some character in here to fulfill your own grandized ideas about revival and you're going to have him tell everybody where they ache and they hurt. 
while he walks by the homosexual and the sycophants and all the people who are living in adultery and sin. And you call that a prophet? I'll tell you, there's a false face put on too many things. There's a fear of delusion in the world. And to call a man like that a prophet. Dear God, haven't you read your Bible? The Bible always shows a prophet as a man who calls the people to righteousness and to repentance. Didn't you read the first chapter of Matthew and the second chapter of Matthew where John the Baptist came preaching repentance and then came Jesus and then came Jesus and then came Jesus. You want revival, you're going to have to repent. I said you're going to have to repent. You're going to have to do more. You're going to have to get a spirit of repentance. You're going to have to get a spirit of repentance. You're going to have to sigh and cry for the abominations. Say, well, if we just have a little compromise here, if we just let the holiness standard down a little bit. Well, I got it to say, I've been coming to PSR for several years, and I'm going to tell you something. I'm seeing some things this year at PSR I've never seen before. Sorry. I've been in my cave up there. I've been, I've been holding the line, thinking that down here, hallelujah, I've got some brethren. And I preach against all this hair that looks like somebody put a bunch of firecrackers in it. I preach against that. I'm going to tell you something. You know what that looks like? That looks like a woman ready for bed. That looks like a woman that's got her head laid on the pillow. It's sensuous. You need to put your hair back and comb it right. Who are you trying to look like? All this little stuff coming down in front of your face. Okay, and I'm going to tell you something, friend. Let me tell you something. Behind every work of the spirit or flesh, there is a spirit. Before a man falls into adultery, Brother Morton, he's got to get the spirit of adultery. Before a man becomes a homosexual, a queer, a fag, he's got to get the spirit of that. Oh, I see some of you out here. You look like a bunch of fags. Why don't you straighten your backbone and look like a man? What's the matter with you? I've seen at least two homosexuals since I've been here. What are you doing here? You need to repent. You're going to split hell wide open. But I'll tell you what's worse. Then a queer or two. It's when a spirit of homosexuality gets among the people. A spirit of homosexuality gets among the men. And it begins to break down the resistance and fog their mind and create a problem with their heart and tip them with it. And finally they fall into it. But they gotta have the spirit of it first. And I said that to say this. You've got to have a spirit of a horror before you can become one. You've got to have the spirit of immorality before. You've got to have the spirit of the rock star and of the movie star and of the people in the world. Can I tell you what I really see? I'll tell you what I see. I see some of you young ladies, all that's lacking in you is just the adornments. You've already got the spirit. You've got it in your heart. You've already walking around with the spirit all over you. You want to put your little curls down in front of your face. Pull your hair back. Comb it right. Get it out of your face. 
You see, that's not important. I know that little things are important because they show a spirit that invades the hearts of people. And when people want to slip their skirts up the back like this, dear God, I've been preaching against that for years. And I see it in a PSR. What's it doing here? I said, what's it doing here? Short sleeves. Dear God in heaven, my daddy preached those off of me years ago. I felt naked, Brother Martin, when I put short sleeves on after I got the Holy Ghost. I still do. What am I seeing? I'm seeing a spirit. That's what I'm seeing. And it's disguised itself as, oh, let's just have revival, brother. Let's just have revival. You ain't going to have revival without repentance. It's false reasoning. It's reasoning amiss. You've written yourselves into it. I believe in revival. I'm going to have revival. I believe you're going to have revival. But you're not going to have revival that way. The worst place in the world you can put some kind of gold or silver junk is in your hair, ladies. I'd rather see it anywhere, on your fingers, in your nose, in your ears, and in your hair. Your hair is your covering. Whew. Well, I'm, I don't know what, how, how long have I been up here. Somebody preached the other day about anointed shields. I want to talk to you about anointed swords. Say, we, we've been going around... Adorning and anointing the scabbards, and 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 the UPC is a good scabbard, and 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 you know other things that we use are good scabbards, but they're not the sword. We come to love the scabbard that is wonderfully wonderful invention when it's used to house the sword of true and fine steel. It becomes dangerous when the importance far outweighs the weapon it holds. Uh, we embellish the scabbard while the sword rusts in a sheath. I fear we've spent too much time, money, energy, and, and scabbard of politics and organizational infighting and posturing and not enough on the anointing. Not enough on the seeking of God. Not enough on dealing with problems. And you're not going to get anywhere in God until you're willing to deal with them. Scabbard represents outside show and vanity and display. And the sword represents intrinsic worth. The scabbard is ever a semblance. The sword, the reality. The scabbard is the temporal. The sword, the eternal. The scabbard is the body. The sword is the soul. We put the scabbard of men and man-made organization on a pedestal and adorn it with great honor and great jewels and great wealth and great prestige. While all the while true men of tempered steel, of great anointing, are placed in the back burner somewhere down the line of importance near the manger. We have our priorities backwards. When we look at the vintage of a man's car and the price of his suit, before we ask him to preach, we exclude the John the Baptist, the Elijahs, the Apostle Pauls from our churches. We adorn the scabbard and let the sword rust. When we choose a man because he can draw a crowd and not because he can preach our people under conviction and bring to true revival, we adorn a scabbard and not a sword. When you bring a man to your church, he calls himself a prophet, but all he sees is the people getting rich, people getting healed, and all the while walking past the adulterer, fornicator, and a homosexual, a child molester, and a liar. And I might say the man in the wheelchair. You exalt the scabbard while the swords rust in their silly bejeweled, bedecked, bedeviled scabbards. Kingdom building. How? Why do we suffer it so? It's like a social disease. We catch it from one another. You get one liberal in among you and they know how to get in, friend. I've worked with them. I know they know how to squeeze in and get next to you. Believe it. And then they begin their insidious work. 
everyone somewhere okayed some things. And we didn't check to find out who because groupthink and collective guilt <clears throat> takes the sting out of it. If somebody else is doing it, I guess it's okay. Scabbard is ever useless in the hour of emergency. Then it is upon the sword itself that we must rely. Then the worthlessness of show, sham, pretense, and gilded weakness is revealed in us. Then the frivolities of life are seen in their true form. The nothingness of everything but the real, the tried, the true is made luminant in an instant. Then we know whether our living has been one of true regeneration, of keeping the sword clean, pure, sharp, and ready, or one of mere idle, meaningless, day-by-day -day markings of folly on the empty scabbard of a wasted life. Then we wish for a sword, but sometimes cannot find one sharp enough to cut through the, round, the proud flesh and get to the heart of the matter because they have spent so much time rusting in their scabbards. Hallelujah. You say, what's the answer? I'll tell you what the answer is. Repentance. Make us feel good, Brother Kelly. You don't need to feel good right now. The next fellow comes after me, he'll probably make you feel good. That's, that's, that's the way things work, and they ought to work that way. But you need to feel something. What I'm, You need to understand that all this other stuff out here isn't going to get you past the fact that you're going to stand before God yourself alone and give an account for your church and for your family and for your life. And if we want to have true revival, we're going to have to have true revival. Repentance. Hallelujah. I'm out of time. Let's stand. Hallelujah. Let's talk to God. Let's talk to God.